Good Morning San Antonio starts right now. Hi, good morning. Happy Wednesday. It is July 6th. We're going to talk to Justin in just a moment about those extreme temperatures that continue. But first, this morning, a single meal may have cost a local family their home in far west Bear County. Firefighters believe a fire that left the family out in the street was sparked by outdoor cooking. It broke out around 430 this morning near Loop 1604 and Petranco Road on Stable Glen. As Katrina Weber tells us, the backyard barbecue is getting the blame. Firefighters say they plan to take a long, close look at the barbecue grill. They believe that is where the fire began. A woman who lives in the home says she also believes that the barbecue grill was the cause of the fire. She says they recently had been doing some outdoor cooking, but it was clear that the fire did not stay there. I'm shooting through the roof when they arrived around 430 this morning. That fire in the 900 block of Stable Glen had broken out in that home and firefighters were concerned that it might spread to those next door. The homes are very close together on that street. Now they tell us that there are five people who live in the home where the fire started, but only three were home at the time. They all made it out safely, but one of their pets is still missing. The people in the homes next door got out of their homes just in case, but they were able to go back later on without any real damage to their homes. Uh, firefighters say that this home is destroyed, so it's unclear where this family will go from here. Reporting from downtown, Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. And from here, we take a look at today's 9 at 9. A man accused of driving a tractor trailer filled with migrants is expected in federal court today. 45-year-old Omero Zamorano Jr. is expected to learn if he'll be eligible for bail. 53 people died in the tragedy last week. Three other men were also arrested in connection with the case. Uvalde District Attorney Christina Mitchell Busby is facing calls for her removal. This comes as Uvalde's Mayor Don McLaughlin claims she has failed to deliver compensation resources to the victims' families in a timely manner. The mayor and state senator Roland Gutierrez sent a letter to Governor Greg Abbott asking him to replace her and have the Texas Department of Emergency Management to take over the role. Arraignment is set for this morning for the man accused of shooting at a crowd of 4th of July parade goers Monday. Seven people were killed and more than 30 were hurt. A motive for the shooting is unclear. If convicted, he would be sentenced to life in prison without parole. A curfew in Akron, Ohio, has been lifted after days of protest. It began after police released body camera footage showing the fatal officer-involved shooting of a 25-year-old Jalen Walker. Eight officers involved have been placed on paid leave. The January 6th committee's next public hearing will be Tuesday, July 12th, and will focus on the white nationalist groups who took part in the riot. While the hearings in Washington are expected to wrap up this month, a criminal investigation in Georgia is ramping up. That investigation is looking into election interference. The spat between the U.S. and Russia continues as the U.S. plans to snub Russia at an international meeting this week. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is heading to Indonesia today for the G20 foreign minister's meeting. But officials say he likely will not go anywhere. He might run into his Russian counterpart. A mixed day for the markets with traders now worried about slowing economic growth. The S&P barely had a 0.2% gain in yesterday's trading, but the Dow lost 0.4%. And the NASDAQ finished the day down 1.7%. Also on the way down, the price of oil. The prospect of a slowing economy has some traders expecting demand will fall. And that helped push West Texas intermediate futures down more than 8% to just under $100 a barrel. Oil prices haven't been that low since early May. The recent run-up on home prices has turned into higher mortgage debt. In a new report, credit rating agency Experience says the average millennial with a mortgage owes over $250,000 compared to 30-somethings who were borrowing in 2020. That's up about 10%. And the average millennial owes 11% more than the average U.S. homeowner. And that's today's 9 at 9. And taking a look outside with live cam this morning. So I was cold inside the studio, Justin, and I stepped outside and it's all good now. Warmed up very quickly. Fix it very quickly. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, it, the temperatures already racing up again today. Yesterday was another one of those days. We were at 105th day in a row. Not that, uh, you know, we're not going to add on to that because we will. 
uh, next several days. I want to show you the highs across the country. 102 in Dallas yesterday, 100 in San Antonio, 100 in Oklahoma City, 97 in Wichita, 103 Memphis, 101 in St. Louis. There was some big time heat across a large portion of the country, including here in Texas. And as uh, we look at, uh, let's see here. Clicker is never working. There it goes. So we look at the highs for today. 101 here in San Antonio. The forecast high 100 in Castroville, 100 in Elmendorf, 99 in Seguin. This looks very similar to yesterday, mostly sunny skies. But here's what we're sort of concerned about as we head towards the weekend. We're going to see those temperatures get up close to uh, 105, I think, in some cases. Not not today, but as we get into Saturday and Sunday. Today, again, highs around 101, I think, around 5 o'clock. Southeast Julie winds anywhere from 10 to 15 miles per hour, mostly sunny. Temperature still around 95 at 8 o'clock, 92 by 9 p.m. Big time heat. We've also got heat index values to worry about. Also, rivers starting to dry up a little bit. At least the flow is not great. We're going to take a look at those numbers coming up here in just a few minutes, guys. Thank you, Justin. We've got a reports of a vehicle on fire, 410 southbound at I-10, but right now we're not seeing that on Transguide. The morning commute is over. You're looking at I-10 and UTSA and I-35 at San Marcos, looking back towards downtown. In your other morning headlines, Carlos Santana collapses on stage and a local Mexican restaurant had some shall we say unwanted visitors? Yeah, plus an incredible fire rescue and the winners of the wife carrying competition. David Sears is here with all these stories. Good morning. Good morning. There's a lot of good jokes right there, but I'm not sure we want to tell them. Okay. Not right off the top. We'll wait, we'll wait. <laughs> he was in a little trouble with that one, so we'll get to that in just a second, but first, he is a legend guitar playing Grammy award winning artist who can still pack them in. But last night was a rough one for Carlos Santana. He collapsed on stage during a concert. Behind that black curtain, medical staff attending to the 74-year-old. He was on an outdoor amphitheater stage just outside of Detroit when he was overcome by heat exhaustion and dehydration. Temperatures in the Detroit area were about 90 degrees, and that's about 10 degrees above normal. After he got help, he posted on his Facebook a thank you to his fans for their precious prayers. He is expected to be okay. He was scheduled to perform with Earth, Wind & Fire tonight, but that show has been postponed. All right, this one might make you squirm a little or maybe even a, even a lot. I'm getting out of here. Rita Longoria posted this video. She got four rats running around a Taco Cabana in Leon Valley on TikTok. Rita says she stopped early Sunday morning. She saw the rats instead of employees. She wanted to post a video to alert other folks who might be looking for some breakfast tacos. It was disgusting. It was like unreal. It was unbelievable shock. I wanted it to blow up, not for myself. I wanted it to blow up because people needed to know. I mean, people can get sick, you know. The restaurant says the rats migrated from an outside source over the last couple of days. As soon as they found out about the visitors, they closed down, did their sanitation and inspection, and they should be ready to reopen today. All right, let's take it to Indiana. This is body cam footage, and those are police officers helping rescue some folks from a second floor apartment fire. Six people were trapped, five of them kids ranging in age from three to 13. They started jumping out of the window. The officers were right there to make the catch. Finally, grandma also made the jump. You see your niece or you see your child, and I think you just take it personal and know that you got to do what it takes to get those kids out. While the Madison police officers are being held as heroes, they tell me the true hero is the young girl whose quick thinking led her to break this window, allowing her and others to escape. After they got all the folks to safety, some of those officers picked up a water hose and started fighting the fire. One of the officers has 15 years of experience as a fight fighter, so there's some double duty for you. Thank goodness they were around. And finally, talk about carrying your wife. <laughs> okay, <laughs> literally, not, yeah, okay. You're looking at the winning couple in Wisconsin's statewide wife carrying competition. That is Caleb and Justine Rossler. Husband carries the wife through an obstacle course, including a mud pit and tires. The winning couple gets a cash prize, and then they get beer that weighs as much as the wife that the husband had to carry. The winners say practice was the key to their victory. We basically did uh, two practice runs in our backyard, kind of peeked around, make sure nobody was watching us, but uh, just basically put her on my shoulders and ran for like 30 seconds just to see what, uh, what technique worked best. We watched the videos of prior year races on the Monona uh, you know, Festival website, and I think we were just worried that we didn't want to drop her in the water and get wet, so um, I, think she, I think you were worried about the tires, me tripping yeah, on the tires, yeah. but. I didn't want to, I didn't want to fall. <laughs> 
<laughs> serious preparation. <laughs> oh my God! I don't know, Steph. You and uh, you and Luis. Oh, I, no. I don't know. I, I feel, like no, I feel bad for him on this one. I, I probably would have to carry him. Maybe a, <laughs> a husband carrying competition. That might be good. Look at that. That's like through the mud and all that. Yeah. Look, at, look at they're just hanging on for dear life. Yeah, I've seen this before. I've never seen them wear helmets before. That's probably yeah. a good idea. Yeah, uh, yeah. That, I would think Stare that would be. Safety precaution. Can you imagine idea. that discussion when you get home if you drop your wife on her head Ooh. during this thing? Yeah. I think the smart play is not to talk about this at all. And yeah, yeah, yeah we should just move on. All right. <laughs> like, Thank you, David. Maybe participate. The smart play next time. Not, yeah. I don't always make the smart play, but I am today. 908, mm -hmm. 81 degrees. <laughs> And coming up next, the nation's longest running Latino film festival returns. Tiffany Huertas will be talking to the film festival director about how the event changes the lives of filmmakers. Plus, later in the newscast, latest on COVID vaccines for young children and where parents can take their kids if they're having a hard time finding a place to get the shot. San Antonio's original Latinx Film Festival returns this week at the historic Guadalupe Theater over on the west side. The 43rd annual Cine Festival San Antonio will feature 85 films, including 22 from San Antonio and 24 in Texas. Tiffany Huetas joins us live from the Guadalupe Theater with more details about this festival. Hey Tiff, what types of films are lined up out there for the festival? Good morning. There are a variety of films, everything from comedy, horror, and even documentaries. Some of these films were shot along the Texas-Mexico border, and others were shot right here in San Antonio. To talk a little bit more about this festival, we have Eugenio here. He is the film festival director, and Mark and David both involved in films here. Eugenio, we'll start with you. Talk to us about what makes this festival so unique. Well, Cine Festival is unique because it's a collection of Latino films and indigenous films. Indigenous films, most of them are made in Texas. We have a little bit of international, a little bit of U.S. films, but most of the work that you will see here is made in Texas. You all got a lot of interest this year. Talk to us about that. There is a lot of interest, yes. Um, I think it has to do with the local films and the, and, the, and the fact that we have a lot of films that showcase Texas personalities. So, you know, we, we do expect, you know, to, people to enjoy a lot of good films this year. And Mark, talk to us about your film. What is it all about? Uh, it's an 18th century Gothic horror story that takes place here in San Antonio at that time. Um, Pretty proud to show it here and showcase our world premiere here. Our entire cast and crew is from the San Antonio area, so we're really excited to show it. How long did it take to make this film? Oh, uh, it, what is it, the name? it is uh, Cuerpo is the name. Um, we shot most of it in about two weeks, but took a couple extra months to uh, shoot it, uh, edit it, and um, honestly, it's probably about four years with the pandemic getting in the way, so we're very excited to uh, show it finally. Awesome. And David, talk to us about what film you're going to be showing. We're representing Albuelo, which was uh, filmed in Los Angeles, and then uh, Life is Art, which stars Pepe Serna. It's a biopic documentary on Pepe Serna from Corpus Christi, who started out in Hollywood, homeless, went from Corpus Christi, and then he became, you know, known as one of the best character actors of our time. Over 100 films he's done. Uh, over 300 television shows. He's on a series right now called Life is Art. He's in his 70s. He's just kicking, you know what, right? So he's really proud to represent Pepe, and he's really one of um, our Chicano icons, and we're just so proud of the work he's done and to be able to showcase him in the opening uh, tonight. There's going to be people from all over coming to this festival. Talk right. to us about how exciting that is. Well, it's exciting to be here. We've been touring all over the country with Abuelo, which is a short film, which is opening first, and then right after, this back-to-back -back film with Life is Art, Pepe Serna. And it just really talks about his life and experience in Texas, growing up in Corpus, and how you make that transition from a small town over to Hollywood and, and the suffering that happens. And, you know, the, the main thing about uh, Life is Art is that Pepe is a person that really expresses about life is to be enjoyed, and that's what, it's so inspiring and so positive, and so we're just very proud to work with him, proud to have him a friend, and he's very proud to be Tejano. He's from the corpus where Johnny Canales is from, Selena, Eva Longoria, and Eva Longoria is actually in uh, Life is Art as well. Really exciting. Well, thank you so much. And Eugenio, last thing, why should people come here? Well, to enjoy films that are they, not going to be shown anywhere else. You know, the material that is shown here, Mark's film is a world premiere. Pepe Serna's film is the first time it's going to show in San Antonio. Most of the films here are not available anywhere else. And the ones that are, we're showing because there are special guests presenting the film. So it's a very unique event and uh, you should 
take an opportunity and come and see the films. And it starts tonight. It starts tonight with Pepe Serna. Yeah, with Life is Hard and Pepe Serna. Um, and then uh, David is going to be signing some of his books afterwards. So, and after tonight, we have back to back from noon, 10 in the morning until 10 at night, every day, film after film, short films, documentaries, as you said, feature films, a little bit of everything, films from the family, a little bit of everything. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, tickets, all that information, we're going to have it on ksad.com, and we're going to have a little bit more details coming up on the noon show. Back to you. We look forward to it. Thank you, Tiffany. Justin joins us now, and I heard him uh, discussing Area Rivers in the newsroom earlier today, and I was waiting for you to go down the list and say, mm -hmm. totally dry, nearly dry, uh, just a puddle, uh, so, has some water. Somewhat dry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the general descriptions for this yeah. this year, right? That's actually not far off. It's not great. It's not great. Uh, the drought is really set in, and we still have a couple more months of this, so we're going to be watching these river flows, stream flows, lake levels pretty closely. Let's first start with the Frio River out near Concan. Uh, it is uh, flowing at 3.9, uh, so that's a little better than it was because if you remember a few weeks ago, it was, it was not flowing at all, and that's because we did get a little bit of rain out there uh, over the last uh, few days, some decent rain out in New Valley County. So that, that's helping things a little bit, but unfortunately, the way it's looking, that, that this flow will likely come back down. Uh, as far as the Guadalupe River around Spring Branch, not good news here. We're talking no flow, and the gauge height is actually negative. Now, that does not mean that the, the river is empty right there. It just means it's below the zero level of the gauge height, but still not a good situation. And then the Kamau is flowing decently, as it often does. It's a, it's a small river, but uh, the stream flow is the lowest since November 2014, just to give you some perspective. So... All of these rivers and streams are kind of struggling here because of our drought situation. And you look at the area reservoirs, uh, not looking great either. Uh, as far as Medina is concerned, 14% full. It continues to fall. It's uh, down 64 feet. Canyon Lake's at 92%, and it's a pretty steady level lake, but it's down. Uh, Choke Canyon, 36%. Amistad's at 35%, and all of them down from where they were last year. Uh, and you can expect that these numbers will probably continue to fall just based on our forecast uh, because as we head towards the weekend, we're going to be dealing with some big time heat. Right now, 82 degrees, a couple of clouds out there, steadily winds at 11 miles per hour, dew point is at 71. So it feels like 86 when you factor in the humidity. Cloud cover is going away very quickly. This is far less cloud cover than we saw yesterday. So a lot of sun today should push, push temperatures up above 100 degrees. 79 Boulevardy, 80 Canyon Lake, 82 in New Braunfels. It's 77 Bernie Stage, 81 right now in comfort. Forecast highs today up around 101 here in town. But keep in mind, it'll feel warmer than that with the humidity. And just about everybody will be right at that century mark, if not a little bit above. When you factor in the humidity today, the heat index could go as high as 100 and four. That's just outside of advisory levels. But as we said yesterday, you just got to be careful. Heat advisories are posted for parts of Texas and extend all the way up across the Memphis, St. Louis areas. This is underneath where the big ridge will be today. Everything is going up and around it. So there is rain up across parts of Iowa and Michigan as everything kind of rotates around this ridge of high pressure. But if you're anywhere underneath it, pretty much squashes any rain chances and keeps things really toasty. So how does it look as we go into the future? It actually builds some and moves back over Texas, which is why by Saturday, now this is just one computer model, but this is what it's spitting out for temperatures. 105 San Antonio, 110 in Dallas. This is on Saturday and Sunday is not much better. 109 Dallas, 102 San Angelo. Uh, and even by Monday, we're still getting these big time temperatures. Now, I don't know if they'll be this hot. This is just one model, but it gives you an idea that this ridge means business. Forecast for today, 91 degrees by noontime. We're up around 101, as we said, by 5 o'clock. Southeasterly winds will be a little bit breezy from time to time, 10 to 15. And the extended forecast, well, I think we, uh, I think we get close to some records this weekend, uh, especially on Sunday. Right now, we're going 104 Saturday. 105 on Sunday. Thankfully, we'll have a little less humidity over the weekend, but this is this is getting to that point where it's not fun to be outside at all.
guys. No, and I feel like that planning forecast is just getting a little higher and higher every time we check back. Uh, that's what I was worried about. Just looking at the models this weekend, it's uh, that there's going to be some records going down and all of Texas is going to be banking. Are you worried that it's going to be a little higher than that? Realistically, could be. Could be. I think uh, I, I think it's possible. Yeah. OK. OK. Yeah. Well, watch out for it. Thank you, yeah. Justin. And yep. He tells us from the safety of off camera. Thank you, Justin Horn. <laughs> 921, 81 degrees. And coming up next, the scary threats made to one of the members of the January 6th committee. 924, the January 6th committee has announced its next public hearings for next week, but it comes amid threats made to one of the committee members. As ABC's M1 reports yesterday, one of two Republicans on the committee receiving death threats, and he's released the graphic audio calls made to his office. I guess I can't say a whole lot more other than I'll you naturally die as quickly as possible. This morning, Republican Congressman Adam Kinzinger sharing a compilation of threatening messages his office has received in response to his work on the committee investigating the attack on the Capitol. We know who your family is, and we're going to get you. Get your little get your wife, go get your kids. Kinzinger is a father to a baby born earlier this year. The audio posted to his Twitter account includes more than a dozen messages. We know where you live. We're coming to your house. Gonna get you, Mike. Kinzinger and Liz Cheney are the only Republicans on the January 6th committee. We're gonna get you. Coming to your house, son. Gonna get you and Liz Cheney. <laughs> Kinzinger saying threats of violence over politics has increased heavily in the last few years, but the darkness has reached new lows. The committee's next public hearing will be Tuesday and will focus on the white nationalist groups who took part in the riot. While the hearings in Washington are expected to wrap up this month, a criminal investigation in Georgia looking into election interference now appears to be ramping up. A grand jury has issued subpoenas to seven advisors and allies of former President Trump, including Rudy Giuliani and Senator Lindsey Graham. Also subpoenaed, Cleta Mitchell. She was on the infamous call with Georgia's Secretary of State when Trump said he needed to find enough votes to overturn his loss to Joe Biden. Legal experts say Trump's call may have violated multiple state election laws. Trump denies any wrongdoing. In Washington, M. Wynn, ABC News. And it is important to note the grand jury in Georgia cannot issue indictments. It can only make recommendations to prosecutors who will then decide whether to pursue charges. Right now, it's just about 927, 82 degrees. There is more ahead on GMSA at 9. Including the potential health dangers some local doctors are worried about after the overturning of Roe versus Wade. After the break, we hear from one of the survivors of the deadly migrant tragedy last week and what she recalls from inside that tractor trailer, plus the advice that may have saved her life. It is 9.30 as the men accused of driving the tractor trailer involved in that deadly migrant tragedy here in San Antonio is set to appear in federal court. We're learning new information about that day from a woman who survived the ordeal. Jennifer Yulisa Cardona Tomas survived sweltering temperatures while trapped in the back of the semi. She spoke with the Associated Press from her hospital bed, and Patty Santos shares what she had to say. Jennifer Yulisa Cardona Tomas is from Guatemala. The 20 year old says she was trying to get to North Carolina in hopes of finding work. Her father helped by paying $4,000 for a smuggler that was less than half the total cost. Cardona Tomas left Guatemala on May 30th and was in Texas by June 27th when she climbed into the back of the trailer. During her hospital interview, Cardona Tomas remembers her friend's warning to stay near the door of the trailer where it would be cooler. It's advice that may have saved her life. She was one of 11 survivors. Cardona Tomas remembers people yelling and some even crying and yelling for the doors to be opened because it was too hot and they couldn't breathe. She says she then remembers a truck moving slowly before passing out and waking up in the hospital. We've got an 18-wheeler. None of them are able to talk. As 53 migrants died when the hot trailer was found near Quintana and Casson Drive. A memorial is being kept up for the victims. The victims range in age from just 13 years old to 55. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. 
Cardona Tomas remains in the hospital. The parents didn't learn she was okay until days after the tragedy. And during her interview, she recalled the floor of the tractor trailer was covered what she believed was powdered chicken bouillon. It was an apparent attempt to throw off dogs at the checkpoints. And moving now to the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe versus Way, paving the way for bans on abortion. We spoke to a couple of local doctors who are putting their opinions to the side to focus on the science and statistics. Two doctors from here told Courtney Friedman about what potential health dangers they're now worried about. In the wake of Roe versus Wade being overturned, the first concern for doctors, maternal mortality rates. The United States has the highest maternal mortality rate in with among all developed countries and Texas is near the top. We also know that black women have a maternal mortality rate that's three times white women. Dr. Deborah McNabb was a private practice OBGYN now pursuing a PhD in bioethics and health humanity. The Texas government has said that a physician may perform an abortion if the woman's life is at risk or she's at risk of major bodily uh, injury. The the problem is, where does that life being at risk begin? She said with the state's six-week ban, pregnant women sick enough to actually qualify for abortion under the law are still waiting to cross state lines because Texas doctors don't want to risk it. Do you really feel like you're at risk of going to jail? If they err on the side of best medical practice, they certainly could be incarcerated. If they err on the side of their own personal safety, they may put a woman's life life at risk. Dr. Randall Robinson, chair of obstetrics and gynecology at both University Health and UT Health San Antonio, worries about pre-existing conditions. There are significant underlying medical issues that we would counsel some women not to conceive. Chronic hypertension, uh, if a woman has cancer and she needs cancer treatment and the pregnancy could be an added uh, stressor or burden on their body. They also say those complicated, unwanted pregnancies could overwhelm an already strained OBGYN system in Texas. It is not possible to provide the standard of care if you are taking care of too many Patients. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. Well, the latest now on COVID vaccine for kids under the age of five. Some parents in Bear County may be having a hard time finding a place to take their children to get the vaccine. Erica Hernandez explains what the city is doing to help parents and the latest numbers on how many kids under the age of five have received that vaccine. One, two, three, we oh, yeah. It's been a little over two weeks since the FDA and CDC granted authorization for the COVID vaccine for children six months to four years old. So far in Texas, close to 23,000 kids in that age group have received the vaccine. And here in Bear County, that number is at 1,077. We're seeing like people are actually coming in because they want it. They know it's going to be safe. It's the safest option when you're trying to protect yourself from COVID. Some parents though are having a hard time finding a place to get the vaccine. Currently, CVS only offers a vaccine for kids 18 months and up and Walgreens for kids three and up. Metro Health is looking to help families as they start to get ready for back to school. We're going to do um, throughout the uh, back, back to school season. So we're uh, engaging with some um, school districts as well. Uh, so you can check the website. You can see which schools we're going to be in and where events throughout the city. Metro Health will be offering five other pop up clinics just like this one this week, including one on Saturday at Traders Village. We're trying to be uh, out there and give as much opportunity to everybody as possible. And that's great that, uh, that everybody's participating. Things to know before heading out to a vaccine clinic this week. Make sure to check the times the clinic is open. Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, Moderna and back to school vaccines will all be offered and no registration is needed. Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. And here's a look at some of the pop-up clinics taking place today. There will be three different locations that you can visit. That will be at the Dwight Middle School, Las Villas de Leon Apartments on West Commerce, and Stevens High School. Those times are on your screen. You can visit KSAT.com for a look at other times and locations of other pop-up clinics that are scheduled. And taking a look outside with live cam, we're creeping up to 82 degrees, but I guess still relatively decent compared to triple digits we'll see later. Yeah, not to correct you, I wouldn't say creeping up. We're pretty much just like 
<laughs> just going, going for it. Uh, <laughs> temperatures uh, will be in the 90s, I think, here within the next couple of hours. Uh, yesterday, we did reach 100. 27 days now of 100 degrees or above. We average 18, so we are so far ahead of schedule, it's not even funny. Uh, we are ahead of pace to beat out uh, previous years in which we saw the record number of 100 degree days. 20, 2009, 2011, both years we remember as uh, drought years, we're well on pace to either tie those numbers or go higher than that. We'll see uh, unless something changes. It looks like we're headed in that direction. Pollen count, molds are low today. They're at 330. They're down significantly from where they have been. So we're not going to worry about allergens this week. It's just going to be heat. 101 forecast high today, 102 Castroville, 102 and Divine. Even Kerrville should be right up near that century mark. Seguin at 99, but heat index values will be higher than that. 103 to uh, 105, I think, is kind of the range we'll have to watch for this afternoon for the heat index, and it only gets worse from there. More big time heat on the way this weekend. Some record setting heat potentially. We talk about it coming up here in just a couple minutes. Thank you very much, Justin. A neat story of a daughter following in her father's footsteps, becoming a doctor. Now the two got the chance to accompany each other in the operating room. ABC's Will Gans shares their story. Sophia Roberts is following in her father's footsteps. In fact, she's followed so closely, the duo recently found themselves performing surgery together. We got to teach uh, tomorrow's uh, cardiac surgeons. And one of them just happens to be my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> is she a good student? She's excellent. <laughs> Sophia is a general surgery resident at Barnes Jewish Hospital in St. Louis. Her father, Harold, is an associate professor of cardiac surgery there. The fellows, uh, they were kind of thinned out because of uh, COVID, quite, quite honestly. And I asked uh, Sophia if she could uh, step in. Sophia recently lending a hand during an aortic valve replacement surgery. Ever since she can remember, Sophia says her heart has led her here to cardiac surgery. It was not just Go Dog Go and See Jane Run books that you were reading <laughs> to Sophia. What was some of the literature that you were sharing with her from a young age? Uh, I hate to say it was Grant's Atlas. I had to go in once for a ruptured aneurysm on a patient and she, she couldn't have been more than three. And she said, uh, was it one of the uh, red ones or one of the blue ones? <laughs> and I was like, that kid gets it. Sophia got it then and gets it now. The first uh, pump case that she first assisted me with, I mean, she she was a champ. What is it like watching her first hand follow in your footsteps? Uh, it, it was great. I can't wait uh, to have it where eventually she'll be doing the entire case and I'll just be helping her. The father-daughter doctor duo says they'll likely wind up in the OR together again soon. Sophia tells me one thing she always knows is when her dad is in charge of the music being played during surgery. By the way, two other siblings in the Roberts family neither work in medicine. Will Gans, ABC News, New York. You know, a joke doesn't fly if dad leans over and says you're doing it wrong. <laughs> yeah. On the OR. Don't want to hear that. 940, 83 degrees. And coming up in the show, we are looking back at the best of Katie Science Lab. Sure are. And by the way, there'll be another property tax workshop later today. To help homeowners learn about how to protest the property taxes. It'll be a pre-K for SA South on South New Braunfels from 5.30 to 7.30 this evening. It's being hosted by District 3 and District 4 council members. You're watching GMSA at 9. We will be back. Just about 9.44, and it's probably, yeah, I was going to say well over 80 degrees right mm -hmm. now. Yeah, and you know, that rain that we got, what was it, like, it feels like it was two months ago. But it was just within the last two yeah, weeks, was it not, Justin? Weeks. It was, it was, but it does feel like a distant memory at this yes. point. It uh, didn't help us much with our drought situation. We are now over five inches for the year. But you know, the, the crazy part about this to me is we're at 5.11 inches for the year here in San Antonio, is we can get five inches in one event. Uh, but those events just not ha have not happened this year. We've had a couple of decent rain events, but not enough to get us anywhere near the average. In fact, we're nearly a foot below the average. Del Rio's at 2.97, over six inches below average in Austin. 
Well, they've had 14 inches of rain, but even that is enough to be uh, around four and a half inches below average. So that, you know, the bottom line is uh, we're in a pretty dire situation here when it comes to rainfall and there is nothing in the seven day forecast. Now, we'll tell you as you look down the line, maybe the end of next week, there's a little bit of hope there. We'll have to get closer to uh, say that with any certainty, though, and we'll, we'll let you know. In the meantime, it is the heat that is the big story. 82 degrees at the airport, 82 cents and 81, Kelly, 81 at Randolph. Southerly winds anywhere from 5 to 10 miles per hour at this hour. Kerrville, 81, feels like 83. The yellow number is the heat index. That's your feels like number with the humidity. Feels like 88 in New Braunfels. Feels like 83 in Seguin. Feels like 86 in Converse. So we're already picking up on those heat index values. It only gets worse throughout the day. Dew points will drop off some but we'll probably be able to tack on two to three degree, two to three degrees onto the actual air temperature for the feels like number dew points at uh, right now are in the 70s for most of bear county so it's still pretty sticky heat index forecast by two o'clock the air temperature is 97 the heat index that pink line you see there on top 102 100 the temperature at four feels like 104 and that'll be the case even through the six o'clock hour uh, so some pretty dangerous heat out there, not only for us, but for a large portion of the country, especially the, well, the eastern half of the country here, 106. The forecast heat index in St. Louis today around 5 o'clock. Kansas City, 104. It'll feel like 107 in Little Rock, Nashville. Forecast heat index, 113. So uh, a, a large portion of the country is baking today. Heat advisories, uh, rightfully so, have been posted for much of those areas uh, and excessive heat warnings as well. And you look at the ridge five pressure, it's a reason for all this sitting there, strengthening a little bit. Everything moves up and around this thing. So you, the, the showers and storms are across parts of Michigan and the Great Lakes, and then a few showers along the Gulf Coast. None of these showers, by the way, make their way into our neck of the woods. So the, the ridge still has a good hold on our forecast, and it actually moves more over top of us by the weekend. So by Saturday, and again, this is just one of our computer models, the American model, but it does show temperatures around 105, the Zaire temperatures on, on Saturday, 110 potentially in Dallas. I don't know if it's quite that hot, as we said earlier, but uh, it, we may get close to some of these numbers, and the heat just keeps right on going Sunday into Monday. It's showing 112 for Dallas on Monday. We'll see. But the, these, uh, these numbers are a little scary there because this ridge does build some but I think after that, it finally moves west, and we'll see those numbers subside as we get into next week. Your case at 12-hour forecast, 91 noontime, and then by uh, 3 p.m., 99 degrees, 100 by 4 o'clock, 101 by 5 o'clock. We cool down, if you want to call it that, 97 by 7 p.m., and 92 by 9 o'clock. Your extended forecast, 101 Thursday, 103 Friday, 104 Saturday. The record on Saturday is 105. We'll be right there. And I do think we have the potential to break the record on Sunday. 105 is the forecast high. The record is 103. And uh, more records uh, potentially. We'll get close to another record there on Monday. So a lot of heat in that forecast. Hopefully, hopefully by the middle part of next week, things change a little bit. Okay. All right. Keeps posted. Well, as some of you may know, uh, maybe you're hearing this for the very first time. Meteorologist Katie Blake is leaving us here at KSAT and headed to the Dallas Fort Worth area. Today is her last official day at KSAT 12. Yeah, she brought a lot of fun to this show. So yeah. we wanted to take a look back at some of the best Katie Science Labs. Hey, Science Lab, going back to basics with a classic science experiment, dropping Mentos into one of those bottles of Diet Coke. I chose this one this week because uh, first, I can't believe we haven't already done it. Second, David's always asking if we can blow something up. So <laughs> There you go. There you go, Katie. There you Katie, go. Katie, Katie. There you there go. Goes. <laughs> we are smoking. Yeah. When we put these Mentos in, that carbon dioxide gas is going to go crazy and it's going to want to push all the liquid out of our Diet Coke bottles. I hear it. I don't know. Oh, look, look. It's oh. Oh. <laughs> Back up. Back up. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> our blue one. <laughs> next, next. So the pop rocks are working. Ooh, ooh. Ooh, ooh. One blast off. <laughs> oh, there. <laughs> oh, there we go. <laughs> Is this mine? You can just have it all. It's. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. There is that CO2 ready to latch yeah. on to these Mentos. All on David's the wrist, counting. Blake. All on the wrist. I'm going to go. I'm going to. 
I'm gonna go ahead and, go. and do a David. Okay. Oh, All right, hurry, hurry. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Oh my gosh! <laughs> <laughs> Pushes so much of the liquid out, oh. so now I've only got a little bit of. Oh! <laughs> Very good. <laughs> this is popular for a reason. Uh, that was all sorts of fun. My question this morning, other than, you know, Katie, best wishes, uh, right. you've been a big part of our family for a while now, is. What's David going to do now for fun? I know. He's I know. going to miss her like we all are going to miss I mean, her. That's just good TV. It yeah. just is what it is. Katie is such a brilliant meteorologist, though. She's so good at what she does. We're going to miss her so much. Yeah, she yeah, got a cushy non-TV job up in the <laughs> yeah. Metroplex yes, but with she, more regular hours, so too. She'll be missed by the newsroom, but also our, our viewers. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to thank Katie for inspiring the kids, the kiddos, to yeah. want to go home and, yeah. and do these you know, science projects. I, I know my daughter you know personally uh, has really you know, liked to follow her you yeah. know on social media and you know here on GMSA at nine so we'll miss you a lot and also on the girly side uh, fellow fashionista I used to love to see what she was gonna wear here <laughs> and her, her choice of outfits but uh, she was a lot of fun to work with she's wow. so good at social media too yes. you can still follow her yes. there and she's still gonna have great stuff yeah so. that's right all right yeah. so best of luck to our very own Katie Blake headed up to North Texas best wishes to you and to Mark Yes. All right, 951 at 83 degrees at San Antonio International. Yeah, and when we come back, a look at the new Thor movie that's being released this weekend. He reclaimed his title as the one and only Thor. Oh, spoke too soon. Jane? Chris Hemsworth is back, but someone else wields the power and name of the mighty Thor. What's it been like? Three, four years? <laughs> Eight years, seven months, and six days. Give or take. Thor Love and Thunder marks Natalie Portman's return to the franchise after 2013's Thor The Dark World. To say that Jane was going to become the mighty Thor in this one was really, really just an incredible opportunity and, and really like a once-in-a-lifetime possibility. So that's the ex-girlfriend, is it? The old ex-girlfriend. Judy Foster. Jane Foster. The one that got away. The one that got away. Yeah, it was really uh, an amazing opportunity to have this kind of dual side that she's human and a superhero and then how each affects the other and to imagine what what that feeling is to like have the powers and then not have them is, is also just emotionally interesting. Let's bring the rainbow. Bring the rainbow, is that a catchphrase or something? You have to like carry yourself differently. You have to have a different bearing. So I did train a lot, but um, there's also a lot of movie magic, of course, involved in, in the transformation. It's just my first bad guy. You never forget your first. In Hollywood, I'm Rick Damagella. Hmm. Okay, uh, 85 degrees already. We're gonna be up around 101 today, a whole lot of triple digits. It's even hotter by the weekend. It's actually 105 on Sunday. All right, I was telling Steph this morning, uh, early Oscar buzz for Christian Bale as the bad guy in this movie, so we'll have to check it out. Yeah, it should be interesting. You guys have a great day.